And welcome back to a fresh episode of Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And if you haven't yet, check out my weekly emails where I share actionable B2B marketing, website and SEO tips, useful podcasts, goodies and more. You can give it a shot over at businessgrowth.email. So joining me today, I've got Arthur Castillo. Arthur is the head of Dark Social and Evangelism over at Chili Piper. Arthur, welcome to the show. How are we doing, man? Good, Sam. This is, a, this is an honor. I know how many awesome guests you had. So to be considered amongst them and, and chatting with you, this is going to be great. You are very, very welcome, sir. And you know the show. You know we don't mess around. We dive straight into topics. No fluff. First and foremost, Arthur, what the flipping heck is a B2B evangelist? Yes, a uh, great, great place to start. And I'm thinking we could even go back to, in a way, I I almost picture myself doing this role before it, um, well, before I, I have this title now, but I, right. I've kind of taken this approach with me from where I started off in sales. Um, okay. And then I always tried to place myself in the shoes of the buyer, but really understanding it from like a business perspective. So right. what is it that, um, how do they make revenue, right? What is their business model first and foremost? What are some of the blockers to that, them getting more revenue, whether it's the, the state of the industry? Who are the people that they listen to that when they come out with um, a podcast or a blog post, whatever it is, they tend to to really be heard by by the audience. And okay. that's the approach I'd always take in sales. Like before even really learning to to master what I'm selling, I really wanted to get myself in in my buyer situation. So taking that approach across um, really industries that I I had no business selling into. So the first was real estate tech. Never owned a house, never did anything. So we really had to, to dive into that. Then it became automotive tech and selling okay. to car dealers. And um, before Chili Piper, then it was selling to dentists. So all of those industries had no idea what um, really any background in it. But from the point of how I approached it, which is like coming to understand my buyers, I noticed that the conversations that maybe I was having compared to other sales reps were more on the trusted advisor level where they came to realize quickly like, hey, this person is pretty ingrained in our industry, knows what's going on, follows the same people I do. And it just really shifted the mindset of what those conversations were all about. It wasn't, hey, I have a, a product or service that I'm trying to sell you is, hey, I'm trying to understand your situation. Oh, by the way, I think there's a way that we can help based on me understanding your situation. Um, so I've always approached sales in that sense and it must have been a little evident to our marketing team here at chili piper in that um they at first it started off with a coffee chat and right. from there with our former dir director of demand jen kaylee edmondson and she must have realized like what i was already doing in terms of linkedin and getting involved in communities um i know we we left that call her asking the VP of sales for 10 to 20% of my time. And then it basically turned out to be a, a full on recruiting effort. Um, so start off in, in field marketing and building that team from scratch. And I think now how I'm approaching um, the, the head of dark social and evangelism comes a lot from how I approach sales, how I built the, the field marketing department and now mm. um, trying to put customers at the center of that. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, Sam, um, what the heck is a B2B evangelist? At least how I pitched, how I look at my role is the, the dark social piece, which is how do we create that shareable content that's either educational or entertaining that's going to be circulated amongst your buyer groups? And okay. then the evangelism piece to me is, um, and we can get into how I, I kind of bucket different um I guess, groups of evangelism, but getting those buckets, uh, whether it's partners, communities, customers, to really evangelize and sing our praises. I think our best sales reps are our customers. So how do we start creating content with them, getting them involved in the sales process so that the peers that are evaluating Chili Piper, um, I think what customers have is something that sales and marketing very rarely has, if ever, which is we can speak to the what, which is the product. We can speak to the why, which is the the problem we're trying to solve in the market. But very rarely can we speak to the how. 
how I use it day to day, how it integrates with my tech stack. Let me show and tell you, um, screen share what I'm doing day in and day out in, in that specific tool. So that's the gap I think customers fill really well. And I'm starting to believe more and more that that's how people want to buy. They want to buy from their peers and they really want to understand the how. I think um, the what and the why could be illustrated through things like your website, but I right. think you want to get a peek behind the curtain and really understand how it's being used in the day to day. Got it. A lot to break down there, sir, but yeah. appreciate the intro. For anyone that's not heard of dark social before, what would be your explanation of it, Arthur? I think to, in a marketing sense, it's a little bit of a rebrand. I think uh, the easiest way to understand it is it's, it's word of mouth. Um, but the difference is I think the frequency at which it exists and how we have access to our peers. So even something like LinkedIn, which I know we're streaming live to five, 10 years ago, it was pretty much a digital resume. You're only logging in if you're looking for a new job. And now I, I know for myself, it's how I, I learn a lot about what's going on in the industry. I follow some people that create really compelling content um, and I'm educating myself. And on top of that, I'm getting to message people one-to-one -one and saying, hey, that was really interesting or, hey, what led you to, to lead to this insight and, and take action on it? Um, and I think buyers are now, in the past, maybe it was a couple annual conferences that they would get together in a room of their peers and say, hey, what's going on? Now, the frequency at which it exists in the channels that we have, whether it's social media or communities, it can happen on a daily basis. Um, so that's it's scaled word of mouth. I think the dark part is um, every marketer wants to know where the attribution was created, where the demand was created. But most marketing attribution software will tell you that, hey, they came in direct or organic. But really, yep. the, the dark piece is what happened before that? Was it me and Sam having a chat at a conference that <laughs> you can't get insight to? Was it somebody in the LinkedIn comments saying, hey, you should check out this this uh, this tool? And I type it into to Google and I go about doing that, right? So I think it's scaled word of mouth co uh, combined with the inability to see where the demand was actually generated. Nice one. So you dropped uh, a few points at the start of the chat, Arthur talking about evangelism and letting your customers sell for you mm -hmm. and i really like the sound of that not something we've chatted a great deal about on the show at least recently um and before that as well you mentioned something interesting that you became kind of a in your sales roles before you took up this role you're aiming to be a trusted advisor mm -hmm. which naturally in b2b when you're selling products that aren't transactional that have got a longer sales cycle, trust is so important, right? Like without that, it's nothing, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, probably not going to even get a call with a, a prospect without a basic level of trust. And then when someone's shipping across to you thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, um, it's one of the key foundations that marketing and sales need to get revenue over the line. Now, mm -hmm. let's talk about evangelism, customers selling for you. You mentioned that people want to know the how, Let's dive a bit deeper into that part. And what, what does that really entail, customers selling for us? What, what, are you, what are you offering there or talking about? Yeah, um, I'll break it down from like maybe a, a traditional top of funnel and, and bottom of funnel approach and how we're looking at it here. So top of funnel, um, it's creating content with these customers. And it can be kind of both in two parts. One, it can be either maybe things that they're experts at that, you know, their audience um, really wants to hear about or, or kind of using their expertise to blast it out to our audience and things that they might be interested, in, whether it's um, how to create a high converting uh, conversion pages or whether it's how to create a, a better outbound system um, and it, an outbound okay. go to market playbook. I'm also yep. looking at it from the perspective of what we just talked about, the how. So we right. are doing customer-led webinars where it's a little bit of a show and tell, right? Where we kind of go through the traditional customer story of, okay, walk us through where you're at when you first were, we're recognizing that, hey, this is a problem you need to act on. What were some of the things you tried? And the, the part where I think peers want to see more and more is the how. So actually going through a screen share, hey, this is how it's set up. Um, this is how the approach we've taken, this is what we've tested in the past. And at the end, really just creating like an AMA for customers to ask this 
specific power user, hey, yeah, how did you go about doing that specific piece? Or how long did it take you to implement that? Or how come you're doing it this way instead of that way? So really creating an environment where it's the customer leading kind of the webinar and they're breaking down their buyer's journey, what they've done and how um, the results they've had and how they've come to actually design that day in and day yep. out. That's from the content perspective. And then the uh, the top of funnel, right? Creating content with them. Um, ideally, it's something that they're worth, uh, it, it's worth sharing to their network. Because I think it's one thing for us to publish it on our website or our social pages, but a whole nother level of if they're actually taking pride in it and saying, hey, check out what I just did with Chili Piper. Um, sure. And they're posting it natively on, on their socials. The bottom of funnel piece um, works hand in hand with, I think, our partner rev share. So there's a couple ways in which we're going about doing this. Um, and we, we um, give back to our customers if they're helping us either break into net new target accounts or they're helping us influence deals that are already evaluating Chili Piper. So one way in which we're doing that is actually funneling a spreadsheet of open opportunities um, amongst some of our champions and saying, hey, do you know anybody at these companies that are, these are at, they're actively evaluating Chili Piper? Yep. You, um, maybe you know somebody there. Maybe it's like their best friend that's in RevOps and like, holy crap, I had no idea. Yeah, let me mention them and tell them that I use this day in and day out and it's an amazing tool. Um, so that's how we're kind of looking at, and I'm trying to combine both of them. We haven't uh, done this yet, but almost creating like affiliate landing pages where we can house okay. the content that we've done with these customers. And on top of that, if they were to take an action or book a demo, we have um, a partner rev share tool that actually tracks that all the way through close one revenue. So that can be shareable. I'm thinking more on a one-to-one -one basis versus them just posting and saying, hey, look at all the stuff I've done with Chili Piper, although I'm sure some will. But I think it's more of the, hey, notice you're checking out Chili Piper. Or, hey. Um, I work pretty closely with the Chili Piper team and, and they seem to think you'd be a good fit. Check out some of the content that I've done with them and then helping uh, us break into those accounts. So that's how I'm kind of looking at it from a, a top of funnel approach and then getting them more involved in the bottom of funnel deals. Yeah, that's interesting. I've not heard of something that quite that open before where you have literally like a list of these are the accounts that we're working at the moment. We're trying to break into or we've got a baseline relationship with. And then introducing those to existing customers and saying, look, are any of these kind of potential referrals and they can share the perhaps content that you've produced together. And obviously, if it's coming straight from referral, those are some of the best intros that you can get mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and is, is going to seriously influence that the chance of you winning that deal. So that's quite an interesting and transparent approach that I've not really seen much in action, to be fair. Yeah, it's, it's something that... Um... I think we've probably seen it more in the B2C side, right? The whole influencer marketing campaigns. And mm. I think the difference with that is it's very transactional. And a lot of the time they're not, they're almost using their brand and monetizing it and not putting their reputation at stake. Whereas I think that's the biggest difference in B2B where buyers, if they're recommending a product that's not going to do the job, now all of a sudden their their professional reputation is on the line. So I think... It's one, identifying those that truly believe in what you're doing and have seen the results and the problems that it solves. And yep. the, they're already probably singing your praises. So in a way, how do you amplify that and create the environment so that you can create content with them or they have ways to, to get in on the upside of, hey, if I'm already referring these to other directors of demand gen or heads of rev ops, how do I kind of get a little bit of a cut out of that? So it is a pretty novel approach and um, it seems to be pretty working pretty well for us. Yeah. And would you say those are the main use cases of customer evangelists kind of creating content together, looking for referrals? Um, is there any others that companies should consider? I think so. I think like I, I just tried to bucket in like that top of funnel place of, OK, because what we're finding, even with some of the influencers we're working with, of course, they have a huge network, but they don't really want to be an SDR. Right. They don't really mm. want to help you break into accounts. So that's when I noticed and and I heard from our, our customers and champions that, hey, I think it's a lot easier to help influence deals or un identify people that are already um, checking out your product. And maybe if I know them, that's easy for me to say, hey, heard I 
heard you're checking out Chili Piper. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually worked with them in the past. In some cases, I've implemented them three different times at different companies. Um, so always happy to chat and here's some of the content that I've used. I'm not sure if there's anything outside of that, whether like you're creating content with them, that's how people want to get educated. They're learning yep. from their peers and then they're kind of helping us in those bottom of funnel deals, whether that's breaking into net new accounts or, or influencing them. But yeah, I don't know if you have any other ideas, Sam. I'm all ears of how to how to improve this evangelism program. No, no. I mean, if, if you're creating that content anyway, naturally that can be used across paid. So if you're doing like LinkedIn yeah. ads and you're serving out content of your customers, literally talking about use cases of your offer, of your product, your solution, how it's helped them fix their problem, how it's helped them improve certain results and all this good stuff, then naturally if you're getting that in front of idle clients on channels like LinkedIn with paid distribution, that's going to gonna be pretty impactful. Um, when you're serving that to perhaps people that have visited your website already or that fit your target market, that's going to be helpful as well as the other the other fronts that we've talked about. So that's cool. Now, moving forwards, what are some of the use cases when it comes to events and communities? And perhaps we can break this down into kind of how how, uh, how you get involved and how you see B two B evangelists getting involved in, on the event side and on the community side. Yeah. So on the event side, um, this was pretty interesting too, in working with communities when we first started, um, or I guess when I, when I first came into marketing, I think communities were really taking off. It seemed like everybody wanted to create their own community. It was the flavor of the month. And at the time we felt that our audience wasn't necessarily large enough for us to go off and do our own thing. So we sponsored a lot of these communities to, in a way, rent their audience, right? Um, they helped with the distribution. They helped with putting the events. They they had an ear to the market of like, what was our community talking about? And maybe we could create content around that. Um, so that gave us a pretty good idea of one, I guess the baseline of how to work with some of these community partners. During that time, some of them offered these executive level dinners. And we thought it was going to be a great idea, right? An intimate setting where you can get in front of our ICP. Mm. The trouble was that some of them didn't necessarily deliver either the attendees that we wanted or even from like a numbers perspective, um, how many people were, were attending these dinners. And at the time, my boss and I were thinking, look, what if we actually put these dinners on ourselves we right. don't have to make money off of them because that's not our business model. And whatever money we we recoup in terms of sponsorship revenue, we put directly into the event. And we we partner up with companies that target a similar ICP, similar type of account as us, and we just go to market with them. Um, so it was actually like learning through our customer uh, community sponsorships that led us to really double down on these in-person executive dinners. And that's been a huge part of our, our field marketing program. And one of the first aha moments that we had, we always wanted to invite customers um, to these executive dinners where they could kind of speak on behalf of us and yeah. get, get them in a room full of prospects. But it was amazing when I first witnessed it um, happen right in front of me. So I'll leave names out of here, but it was funny, <laughs> a sales rep um, had mentioned to me, we were trying to get sales to get to invite um, their prospects to these dinners. And that was a, a slow, slow moving um, objective at first. But there was this one sales rep that said, look, there's this deal. Um, the the co-founder is based in San Francisco. I haven't been able to get it unstuck for the past month or two. Do you think it'd be a good idea to invite them to this dinner? I said, yeah, why not? Let's see what happens. And one of our customers we were just um, networking there, having a drink. And the topic of Chili Piper came up. She talked about how she used it. And she said in like three sentences. And this co-founder was like, oh, it's a no-brainer. After she said those three sentences. And I think three weeks later, the deal closed. And this rep was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Now he's like telling all the other sales reps, you got to start inviting your prospects to these dinners. Um, it, it worked wonders for me. So that was pretty cool to see. I wish I like recorded those three sentences, but I think the difference is what we, what we talked about earlier is the how, right? She mm. knew exactly how she was using it day to day. She knew 
probably the co-founders world and what they're trying to do. Mm. And after these three sentences, it became so crystal clear. And it was from a technically an unbiased source where if it was coming from me, he said, like, yeah, of course you're going to say that, right? You're always trying to, to prop up your product. So that um, was kind of the first type of event that we had our customers okay. join our prospects to these executive level dinners. Now we're actually, we're kind of maybe a little early to in-person. We're still doing a ton of those, but now I'm looking at some of these customer led events, um, more on the virtual stage, but I'd say that was a pretty big part on the event side of inviting our customers to these in-person dinners and getting them to interact with their peers face to face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. And I suppose if you've got customers that are on site to join, then that's going to be super impactful, um, especially if they're able to to sing your praises and you're able to invite those target clients that are perhaps close to doing some business with you and get those conversations fired up. So that's, yeah, it's a nice little, nice little idea. Um, what about on the community side of things? I know you touched about on it just now, Arthur. I know you mentioned that you can look to sponsor and almost rent land when it comes to communities so if i don't know one that comes to mind is perhaps rev genius but i know there's tons like pavilion and there's tons of others depending on what type of audience you want whether that's kind of sales reps revenue leaders directors etc mm -hmm. um and you can pay to sponsor webinars or get a post in their emails or all that kind of good stuff um because it's a bit of a funny one, communities, in terms of kind of, is there any examples of what you think work well um, or any kind of recommendations that you have from your own experience when it comes to actually using those to drive revenue for B2B organizations? Yeah. Um, and it's funny because at, at times I've thought to myself like, oh man, our, our community is going to hate me all of a sudden. But I think it's trying to improve the relationship to, uh, between both of them. And I think also given where we were at as a company when we were still kind of growing and scaling um it made a ton of sense for us so I, I can't necessarily give blanket advice of like hey either do this or don't do this i'll only speak from experience so i think at the time it served a purpose um we got familiar across a bunch of these communities we've tried sponsoring a bunch of them and they typically are pretty like, hey, here's the, the sponsorship package you receive when you approach them. What we realized was that I think some of our best community sponsorships went a little outside of that standard package that they would give us. And we could kind of shape and mold a little bit or even bring them into our initiatives. And a great example of that was these in-person dinners. Um, obviously, the, the communities that we were working with in the past that did these executive dinners they weren't as much of a fan of this, but some of these communities that were strictly digital, we almost approached them and said, hey, think of this as an extension of your online community. Like we're going to be mm. throwing a ton of these in-person events. And if you want to invite your members to it, in some cases, we actually even put that in the contract where it was like a, almost a mandate of, hey, you're going to help us fill some of these dinners, which yep. allowed us to get the ball rolling kind of our, on our own in-person events community. So um, that's something that... I would suggest to others kind of understand, sure, they might give you a standard package, but how do you bring them into the initiatives that you're already doing? Or how do you really use their understanding of the community in terms of the topics that are, are being spoken about, um, trending topics, anything that's being mentioned quite a bit, and creating content around that? I think a lot of companies see this as, hey, I cut you a check to a community. Now I get to basically demo my product at scale in front of your thousand members. But people join communities to learn from one another. And I think if you can try and identify who maybe your customer champions are within these communities and do events with them, so it le seems a little bit more grassroots, it came from the community and it just so happens that Chili Piper sponsored this one in particular. Um, that would be my tips in terms of like, not necessarily just going for the standard sponsorship package that the community is offering you. Yeah. Um, trying to work in some of your own initiatives or position it in a way of like, hey, we're working on this and we think it actually would be a value add to your community. How do you think about combining those two things? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I appreciate the tips. And in terms of Chili Piper, I know you guys have got your own podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and like you say, you do various different events and things like that. 
Have you not ever considered trying to start your own in terms of, I don't know, when I say, because in my mind, for some reason, when I think communities, and of course, there's so much more to it, but I think of like massive Slack groups or Discord groups or things like that. Um, but do you think that's just too much of a mammoth task with the amount that there are in the kind of B2B revenue space to actually build a significant one with your own audience? Is that just too much time and effort when there's ones out there that you can effectively advertise on or sponsor on and tap in as you need? That's exactly where um, my my former boss, he was put in that position when he was first brought into Chili Piper. So at the time it was, yeah, community is the flavor of the month. How do we yep. spin up our own community? And he actually pushed back saying, look, I think everybody's going to be trying to do this. There's going to be way too much noise. There's enough communities out there that we can partner with and mm. sort of take this cross community evangelism play where we're playing nice with all of these. In some cases, we're bringing these community leaders together. I know we've even offered to pay member dues if like maybe they invited certain members to our dinners and yep. we would share the list with them and say, hey, any of these people, you would want them to be part of your community and we would offer to pay for their sponsorship. Um, so part of me wants to say there's, there's a lot of noise. I think it also, if you look at the timing of it, these communities got huge during the pandemic, right? Where we couldn't meet people face to face. And it was like, yeah, let's connect with people online. Um, on the other side of it, maybe there's, I'm sure there's like still m many active communities, but some of the ones that I'm a part of seem to have died down a bit in terms of engagement. So I don't know. I think it goes back to like understanding what's the purpose. Is it just to create a community because everybody else is? Is it hmm. to maybe bring together power users so they can actually share playbooks and tips of how they use your tool? Then yeah, I'm probably in favor of something like that. And I know on some level we kind of use our customer advisory board for that, almost like a mini community. And we've actually divided ours into five different groups instead of the traditional one customer advisory board um, based on persona so that people are actually in, engaging with their peers. So I think there's an opportunity for that in terms of the showcasing of the how and maybe getting uh, customers to talk to each other. But in terms of just creating um, a larger Slack community, I think it is a pretty big doing. You probably need a, a couple of head count to make yeah. sure that it's successful. And yep. it's not one of those things that if it's like you build it, they will come. You really have to put a lot into these communities um, in order for people to to continue to show up. And I think some of the best communities, what I've realized they've done is I'm going to steal um, this this uh, word from Alice uh, from Cognizum, the CMO over there, where she called it value loop marketing. Right. And the way I kind of understood that is like, it's something, some sort of event or um, something that takes place consistently that your audience or your buyers show up to consistently and they want to go to that. So whether it's like maybe a, a morning sales call with other sales leaders where you're talking about what's top of mind or it's some sort of round table that like, you can share and tell what projects you're working on and get valuable feedback. I think those are the most engaging, valuable communities where you're showing up time and time again. Um, I mean, Refine Labs comes to mind too, right? Of their demand gen live and now they have revenue vitals. These are weekly types of events that the community shows up to time and time again. I'm sure they have a ton of repeat visitors. It's not like a one and done thing. It's pretty episodic, serialized. That to me seems to be the key to really engaging um, and, and creating a compelling community. If you have some sort of value loop marketing, some sort of uh, continuous event yeah. that people get value out of that they, they'll show up to weekly or monthly or whatever it is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice term. And there's not many of those that come to mind. Like you say, Chris Walker's one's pretty well known. But apart from those couple examples like i can't think of any that have been that impactful in terms of webinars that are weekly that are so successful but at the same time actually really give solid b2b advice answer people's questions and then repurpose for podcasts youtube etc um i think there still is a, a bit of a, a gap in that market for sure um but with that said b2b evangelism um we've touched on some of it but Nowadays, like we talked about a little bit, um, some 
B2B marketers don't necessarily need to be B2B marketers, B2B sellers, B2B entrepreneurs, uh, getting paid literally just to do link, LinkedIn posts mm-hmm. um, by brands because they've got such a big reach. Um, they know they can do a post, get mm-hmm. a few thousand engagements just from an organic post and brands will happily probably pay a few thousand dollars for that post alone. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a funny old game and it all comes back to dark social because the impact of these can rarely be directly attributed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's usually going to be for companies that have got a fair bit of cash to splash out on brand and aren't necessarily wanting direct demo requests off the back of it, but are happy just to build up that brand reputation, build up that affinity, mm-hmm. um, and also get that influencer talking about their, their product because they know they have clout in their ICPs space. Mm-hmm. So my question is what stage should a company be at when they're looking to either hire a B2B evangelist or to get an external one maybe for some paid paid work what do you think mm, um yeah and I'll, I'll it's a good two-part question i'll answer the second part in that i think a lot of people either confuse or or um use influencer and evangelism together to right. me i think the influencer piece falls under the evangelism umbrella so I'll okay. give you like, um, even in terms of how I pitch this role, there's really five buckets of evangelism and maybe there's a six that I'm forgetting, but the first was like myself. Okay. So if I'm the evangelist, what is it that I'm talking about? Am I coming on to shows like yours, Sam, where we can talk a little bit more about that, um, being a key representation across communities. Then I think there's, um, in terms of the question you asked when they should start it, the, the second bucket I pitched to our, to our founders was founder evangelism. And I thought they had such a unique brand for those that don't know they're, they're husband and wife. So very rarely do you see a spouse, um, spouses mm. create a company together and, and one that's very successful. Sure. Um, so that's another piece that I think could get started early on. And I've actually seen founders talk about how once they get on, let's say LinkedIn or Twitter and really sharing their story, they're like, oh my gosh, if there's one thing I wish I could have done earlier is this because the reach is, is insane. So that's the second bucket. Then there's like partner evangelism, which I would kind of put community in as well. Maybe people that you work with, those are the influencers. Mm. Um, bucket four is your customer evangelism, right? So how are you putting them on stage, whether it's creating content, maybe getting them involved in deals. And then the fifth one that I haven't really got off the ground yet, but I would love to, um, I label it as like mini evangelists. So people throughout the company, how do you give them the tools in order for them mm. to maybe share their stories or them to get a little bit more active on LinkedIn um, or wherever your buyers happen to be. Because to me, that's where people are are consuming content natively through the social media platform. And if they're logging in daily, how do you create that distribution effect where it's not just one person or your founders talking about it, it's your entire company actually talking about maybe your strategic narrative or things that you're working on or getting people getting to share things that they're trying out in their roles um, to educate maybe other people that are in similar positions. So those are kind of the the five buckets that I I place evangelism in. To answer your question, I think like founder-led evangelism, that can start from the get-go. If you're trying to match up to where buyers are at today, like, yeah, I think you could probably start earlier rather than later if, if your buyers are kind of logging in daily onto LinkedIn and trying to get educated and hear from other peers, I don't think you necessarily have to wait um, any to, to your certain point at, as a company. I think you can start getting involved in that community um, and getting your message spread across to people that are looking to consume content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sound advice, especially if your founders are willing to share their story and are willing to open up on what their hows, their whys. Yeah. And at the same time, who's better to educate the market on on the problem you solve, how you make people's lives better, the advantages, the industry, the niche you're in, and the, the people that made that decided they invented the offer. Like who can be better? Um, Agreed. Now, the reason I asked you that question was tech's having a hard time right now, especially B two B tech. A lot mm-hmm. of layoffs, a lot yep. of uh, a lot of number crashes, and with people cutting ad spend left, right, and center, are evangelists still a, a smart move when you could perhaps ship the money into paid search or elsewhere that might guarantee a certain amount back when it comes to demo requests or inbound revenue? 
Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously biased being one of those. <laughs> so hopefully my company's not being like, oh, maybe we could shift some of that, that money that we're paying Arthur. Um, no, but I think here's what I'll say. Um, and, and part of the reason where I'm also now doing more in, on the customer marketing side here at Chili Piper is based on where tech is at and the macroeconomic conditions, the slice of net new pie of people actively buying, of having budget, of exploring um, new technologies or services is getting smaller. And I think we're even seeing a shift on on our paid side to more customer marketing, right? The cross sell um, across different products, expansion use cases, maybe getting different departments aware of, hey, by the way, your marketing team already uses us. Um, have you given any thought of like, your CS or sales team using us as well. So I think it's a smart move in that if you know that there's less people in market um, and you're going to get less net new revenue, how do you go back to kind of generating and creating demand and being top of mind, giving people an understanding of maybe why the status quo isn't good enough so that once all of a sudden businesses are now back in the buy now mode, you're mm. going to be top of mind for them. So I think it is more about the the educational piece and yep. being in the, the mind space of where your buyers are at today versus trying to convert them right away. And I think an evangelist is evangelism program is a good way to, to go about doing that. Do you think companies underestimate how important being top of your buyer's mind is? Oh, for sure. And I think that's kind of what got tech in this place, uh, tech in this uh, here in the first place, right? Where it's like growth at all costs, net new, who are we coming in? We're maybe not putting as much of a focus on our customers. And now all of a sudden where everybody's freezing their their buying or budgets are, are being slashed. Now it's like, oh yeah, remember our customers, the ones that have mm. been faithful to us? Now let's turn to them and see how we can get them to use more of our products. So Absolutely. I think it's been way too over indexed on growth at all costs and net new revenue, where now we're forced to kind of take a look in the mirror and say, okay, if that lever can't be pulled on anymore, what other levers can we pull on? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll share a very quick story. Um, yeah. So top of mind wise. So this, this podcast, our, our YouTube channel is small, right? It's just under 1K subs at the time of recording. Mm -hmm. Um. So we never get that many views on videos. Maybe max will get a few thousand per per the video we repurpose after the live. And um, then we put it on the audio podcast as well. But back to the YouTube. So we had a, an inbound inquiry for web choice. I think it was yesterday. And this guy that came in had literally been watching our videos for probably years. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been going three years. So this is like a diehard fan. Yeah. Um, and I said, I literally asked him, like, there's so many web and SEO agencies out there. Like, why us? Um, he said, well, you're consistent you stick at what you said mm -hmm. you do you keep doing it um you don't get tons and tons of views but you're niched into what you do so you mm -hmm. were the top of my mind because i needed in our case website and seo um so that's what i want to use you like i've got a decent budget let's do it like it was lit he'd literally bought in because he'd followed us for so long and we were the only choice in his mind um so for anyone doubting like this this kind of mindset it does work but you very much have to see it through um, it's very much a long-term game, but it can be impactful. And the good thing about a lot of what you've talked about, Arthur, is when you're producing, especially when you're producing content with your buyers and content that answers kind of idle client questions, addresses problems, if you're repackaging that on channels like YouTube, that is literally the second biggest search engine after Google, it's mm -hmm. searchable. So that evergreen bang for buck, the fact that it's searchable for years to come can serve so well for your business on top of all these other advantages that we've talk talked about. Um, so it's just something to, an interesting point to bear in mind for anyone that's on the fence about some of this stuff. It, it's such a great, a great example, Sam. I think also like part of the reason I, I kind of wanted to switch over from sales to marketing is that on average, what do they say? Like one to 3% of, of your target market is in buy now mode. But what about mm. the other 97 to 99%? It seems like everybody's fighting over the one to 3%, right? So how are we creating demand staying top of mind for that other 97 to 99 percent which is a way bigger slice of the pie and i think your example is perfect sure it's been three years um that you've produced this and that was one single buyer but as you take this approach 
buyers decide as to when they're going to enter that buy now mode, right? And if you're staying top of mind, I'm sure you have tons of examples of like, maybe you started six months out, a year, two years, but you're creating opportunities for buyers to then reach out to you and say, hey, I finally got budget or hey, you finally convinced me that the status quo is no longer good enough and I'm going to need to invest in, in some of your services to keep up. So yeah, I think it's such a good point of like, we often really are only catering to the one to 3% in buy now mode, but how are we cater catering to the 97 to 99% of people that aren't necessarily mm. looking for a solution right now? For sure. To wrap up, Arthur, mm -hmm. you mentioned it just now, mini evangelists. I like the term. Um, <laughs> in my head, I just think baby little evangelists, but obviously we're not talking about that. <laughs> um, so I think it's a tough one because if you can get all your employees in your organization, like posting, on social that alone is amazing mm -hmm. then if you can even put get them to put something that's slightly relevant to the niche the industry that's going to add value around the problem you solve the audience you serve customer success stories etc that's massively value valuable to your organization um i know a fair few of the chili piper team are doing this mm -hmm. but is there i know a lot of companies struggle with it some companies try and incentivize their staff any ways that you've, any best practices or any examples that you've tried to implement that have uh, encouraged your team to start posting on social? Um, yeah, I think the the first example is, um, we actually aim to do this every Thursday, is a social takeover. And we'll have a certain maybe theme or content piece that we're trying to push. And we actually create a bunch of different posts for our employees to use either as inspiration or in some cases they can just copy and paste and post it themselves. Um, I think the key with that is there's quite a few many. So there might be like 10 to 12 different iterations of the specific post. So it's not hmm. necessarily the same message, yep. but even for myself, I use it kind of as a, as a baseline. Um, one of the sayings that I love to live by is you can't edit a, a blank page. So even having a starting point and knowing what good looks like and using that to now craft my own thoughts um, is very helpful for me in terms of joining in. So I think like there's different approaches in which you can take, whether it's giving your employees a starting ground and saying, hey, this is what good looks like, giving them some options to just copy and paste um, if they don't necessarily want to write anything on their own. And then I think it's, um, really, this is probably with, with any department, but trying to identify those that are really wanting to lean into it and almost them being like your, your team leads or your mini evangelist leads of having them go through and then sharing the results with their peers of being like, Hey, guess what? I just booked three LinkedIn demos and people being like, how the hell did you do that? Well, I actually started posting on LinkedIn or I engaged with, um, I think a, another thing that I'll add rather than trying to think of a post yourself, a yep. good level one play is just engage with other people's content, right? Comment on it. There's different levels of comments of like, you can just quote people and say, Hey, this really resonated. You can share a story. Um, you can talk to them about your experience with it. So I think that's a way better place to start with than putting the pressure on your employees to say, Hey, start posting, mm. just take 30 minutes, an hour every day and start engaging with your buyer's posts, whether they use it through sales nav. And that's honestly how I got started. I got built up a little bit of confidence, but you also build up a little bit of a tribe so that once you do go out and start posting, your tribe is going to support you because you've uh, you've supported and you re reciprocated for so long that they're like, hey, okay, let's uh, let's support Arthur or Sam on their journey as they start to to share their thoughts more. So, yeah, I guess there's a couple tips there. You can like copy, set up some prompts, um, whether to inspire employees. You can set up some different iterations of posts that they can just copy and paste. But I think mm. one of the the best ones is just to start off and commenting on other people, like flex that muscle, work that muscle a little bit more until you get the confidence to start uh, posting yourself. Good tips. Appreciate it. Arthur, enjoyed the conversation, sir. It's been a, it's been a good back and forth. Hope, hope you didn't find it too challenging when I pressed you a bit on the roll, but uh, <laughs> I, I always enjoy to banter my guests. So hopefully it was well received, but with that, sir, appreciate you coming on. Please do share more about how everyone tuning in can, learn more about Chili Piper, yourself, and any anywhere else you'd like to send the audience to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're a great interviewer, Sam. So this is a, it's been a pleasure. I definitely appreciate the banter and the pressure. Um, in terms of, yeah, I, I think I'm probably on LinkedIn the most. So definitely feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. 
And if you're intrigued about this whole evangelism thing or maybe how to start it at your company, I just posted um, in our chat. I don't know if the, the people can see it there, but me and Nick Bennett actually have a newsletter called The Marketing Evangelist, where we actually talk about tactical tips and what we've done and give people examples of how they can launch level one plays in terms of their evangelism programs and ways to put your customers up on stage as well. So definitely check that out. Awesome. Cool, man. And we'll make sure to put all of those links over on the show notes at businessgrowth.marketing. And with that, thanks once again, Arthur. Enjoy the chat. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure. No worries, dude. And as always, if you enjoyed today's episode, a quick rating or review on Apple or Spotify is appreciated. Or if you're on YouTube, hit that sub button. It goes a long way. And we'll catch you on the next one for more no BS, actionable B2B marketing tips to grow your business, grow your revenue. See you soon.